Hello again everyone from Tokyo, Japan and welcome back to Japan Vintage Camera. Uh, it's a very brisk morning here in Tokyo. Yeah, I usually don't come out so early to make a video but uh, it's really nice this morning and I thought I would come over and take advantage of the empty tables here around the park. Uh, later in the day these kind of become uh, occupied. A lot of people come here to work or eat or uh, chat with their friends or stuff like that but this early in the morning it's still very empty here. Uh, today's video is going to be about a vintage camera, but not a vintage Japanese camera. This is a vintage German camera. Uh, this camera is a Zeiss Icon Super Ikanta 532-16, which dates from about 1937, made in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, this is a medium format 6x6 camera, which uses 120 film. It's an extremely well-made and actually I, th I think quite an attractive camera and uh, uh, can take uh, really amazing photos. Uh, quite a lot of these cameras ended up in Japan. Japan has always been kind of a fan of German engineering and that's why the majority of Leica cameras in the world happen to be here in Japan as well as a huge number of Contax and Zeiss and other German makes. Uh, I, I haven't shot a 532-16 yet. I've shot one of the earlier uh, 6x9 format cameras and I was quite impressed with the performance of it. And I, I plan on taking this camera out uh, to see how well it performs, to see if it uh, uh, can do as well as my old Rolleiflex uh, 6x6 camera, uh, TLR camera. Uh, supposedly these cameras, the, the Tessar lenses weren't quite as sharp as the later uh, Xenar and, or Xenotar and Planar lenses, which I like in the Rolleiflexes, but still they're uh, really good performers. And I, I had a really old uh, Plowbell uh, Machina camera with a 100mm anti-Komar lens, which is not very highly regarded, but I was surprised at how good it really was. I guess among medium format aficionados, the anti-Komar lens isn't uh, extremely sharp or contrasty, but when you compare it to 35mm or other you know, uh, uh, smaller formats, it, it's quite amazing. So I would imagine that the lens in this particular camera is uh, excellent, even though uh, it may not be up to, say, planar or xenotar standards. Uh, the camera is laid out pretty well. It has a kind of a, a large number of controls and things on it, but they're not really that hard to use. And this camera is uh, uh, actually quite simple once you figure out how it works. Uh, the first thing you have to do is open the camera. And this camera has what is called a self-erecting lens. So what you do is you push on the button on the top here. And as you can see, the lens and shutter assembly pop out. Uh, this camera has a paper, a leatherish paper bellows on, on the back, and this is pretty much the only weak link to these cameras. These sometimes develop light leaks in the corners here because of being folded and unfolded or whatever puts a little bit of stress on the corners. Uh, there are several ways to fix these cameras if you have light leaks. Uh, if there are like tears in the bellows, uh, these can be fixed with black gaffing tape or gaffers tape, excuse me, and uh, or black cotton tape, kind of like the uh, bandage tape that they use for holding on bandages. It's kind of cloth and, and quite sticky uh, in black. This works quite well to seal out light leaks. Another thing you can use to seal them is a rubberized black paint. Uh, you can get this on Amazon and this is the kind of uh, paint that they use on t-shirts and cloth which is waterproof and durable and can be uh, moved around a lot without it deteriorating or falling off. So uh, these are kind of inexpensive ways. Uh, replacing the bell is, in these is kind of difficult. The replacement parts are hard to find and all that. So, uh, if, so the leaks have to be really, really bad or tears quite large for you not to be able to uh, fix one of these. Uh, another problem that we have with the old bellows is sometimes they have a lot of, you know, they get dust and the dust gets on the film when you're uh, taking photographs. So uh, before using these cameras, yeah, yeah, or from time to time, I will open the film door on the back and I will blow out the dust with a blower or something like that. 
Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the features and functions of the camera. Uh, starting at the top here, it's kind of flat. Uh, we have a very large uh, viewfinder window on this particular model. The camera which came out before this was the 53016, which is uh, pretty much the identical camera, except uh, it had a smaller viewfinder lens. Uh, on the middle here, we have a shoe for mounting a flash gun. And here we have the film counter dial. Uh, this camera has a mechanical film counter, uh, kind of similar to the Contax uh, rangefinder 35 millimeter cameras. Uh, the, this version of the Super Econta kind of like gave you the best of the both worlds. It gave you the winding and uh, viewfinder system of the, the Contax rangefinder cameras, but in a medium format. Here we have the shutter release button, which accepts a standard cable release. And here we have the film winding knob, which you can turn here, or you can lift up the tabs, and that kind of gives you a little bit more leverage for uh, winding the film. On the back here, we have uh, a window to allow you to see the numbers on the back of the film. And this is used uh, to load the film. What you would do is load the film and then wind the film until the number one shows up in the window and then you would uh, turn the film counter dial on the top until the number one lines up with the counter mark. I'll describe in more detail how to do that later. I'll go ahead and open up the lens again. And uh, as a, this is a, a fixed lens camera and it's a rangefinder camera, but despite being a medium format one, just like a 35 millimeter fixed lens rangefinder camera, you're gonna find most of the controls located on the lens. So on the front we have a the, the front of the lens itself, which is knurled, so you can focus it using just by turning the lens or by turning the focusing knob. Uh, these cameras uh, sometimes have sticky focus. The uh, Super Econtas are well known for that, uh, or, or infamous for that, I, I like to say. Uh, you know, to lubricate the helicoid so it focuses more easily, you kind of have to remove the front lens element, unscrew it, clean out the old grease. Um, and I, used, I like to use kind of a thick oil rather than the grease because it, it, you know, modern thick oil is more durable than the old grease which they used to use and it allows it to turn more easily with less pressure when, uh, with your thumb. Behind that we have the uh, shutter speed ring which I'm turning with my thumb right now and we have a shutter speed range of B or a bulb and one second all the way up to one two hundredth of a second. Now the bulb setting on these cameras is different than on other cameras. Most other cameras, uh, if you set it to the bulb setting, like so, you would then charge the shutter and push down the button, shutter button and that would hold open uh, the shutter. Uh, on this particular shutter, if you try to charge it in the bulb setting, uh, it won't move. So in the bulb setting to open up, you simply uh, press the shutter button and it opens the shutter without having to charge it. And then you release it and the shutter closes. The old uh, uh, Zeiss cameras like this with these shutters are a little bit tricky to, to people who are familiar with later cameras or similar cameras which were made in Japan or other places. Uh, sometimes they think the camera is faulty or there's something wrong with the shutter. It, there's nothing really wrong with it. It just operates in a different way. Behind that, we have the... Uh, aperture ring and this particular lens has, is a Tessar lens with a range of f2.8 f22 and I believe the 53216 the only lens available was the uh, 8 centimeter uh, f2.8 Tessar lens. Uh, behind here if I take it off of the B setting to a regular speed uh, is the shutter charging lever. It's right behind this little window here. You just push it upward toward the top and then uh, the shutter is ready to fire when you've wound to the next frame. Uh, this little window here is actually a kind of a prism uh, which is used uh, to, uh, I guess, uh, generate the split image when you are focusing with the rangefinder. As you turn the focusing ring, the glass lens in this will turn and that will shift the image back and forth through this little window under here and allow you to see a split image in the viewfinder. To the other side here we have a uh, sink to attach a uh, flash. So uh, to operate the camera you 
wind to the next speed you charge a shutter and depress the shutter button uh, this one is kind of past the tw uh, the last frame here so uh, the shutter button is not working at the moment so what I'm going to do right now is I show you how to load the film in the camera and then after that I'll show you how to operate the mechanism so uh, to load the film in the camera of course you have to open the film back and there's a latch here on this side so simply lift it up and uh, open the door and uh, the take-up spool should be on this side here. Let me see if I can uh, go ahead and uh, change that out. There's a lever on the bottom you can pull up and go to the other side. And push that down. So, you would set your uh, film here, uh, your roll of film here. Uh, stretch the film across and feed it into the take-up spool and turn the take-up spool until the red arrows come up on the back and then close the film door and open the window here and wind the film until the number one shows up in the exact center of this uh, red window. On 120 film it has a paper back and on the paper back there are numbers on different parts of the paper back and the different locations are for different uh, formats. 120 film cameras uh, can be 6x4, 5 format, they can be 6x6 or 6x9 and sometimes even 6x12 or whatever. So, uh, but in this case it's 6x6. So when the number one is lined up here then you have to set the film counter dial to the number one. So to do that you push down and you turn it to the left until it stops on the number one and the camera is ready to shoot. So I've charged the shutter. If I push the shutter button, the shutter works. Uh, so uh, to take the next photo, simply turn the dial till the next number comes up, charge the shutter, uh, set your shutter speed, your aperture, compose, focus, and shoot. And that's pretty much all there is to it. And this camera shoots in the 6x6 format, just like uh, uh, twin lens reflex cameras, which are quite popular today. Uh, the good thing about the uh, Super Econtas is that they do fold up, and though it is still kind of a large camera, as you can see uh, in my hands, it's quite a, a bit smaller than uh, later uh, medium format cameras uh, in the same format. I, I like shooting cameras like the the uh, Fuji series, range, fixed lens rangefinder, medium format cameras. I've had a couple of the Pentax 67s or things like that, but these cameras are impossible to carry in your pocket. They're quite large and bulky. But uh, this camera here is small enough to fit in a coat pocket, so uh, quite convenient. It weighs about the same as a twin lens reflex camera, but uh, a lot of people might find this camera easier to use. So, yeah, overall a really good camera, amazing quality with a, a really good lens. Uh, I'll be posting this camera for sale on my Etsy and eBay stores and my new online store, japanvintagecamera.com. Uh, so, if you're interested in purchasing this camera or another vintage Japanese camera, uh, please visit my stores. I'll post links to my stores in the description below the video. Uh, in the future, I'll be making more videos and posting them here. If you'd like to see them, uh, please subscribe. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and I hope you tune in again soon.